so the way the parts uh, parts one and two are broken down in two is part one most uh, usually will involve a single body so you don't have to worry so much about interaction between two objects uh, part two um, you will usually have to worry about interaction between two or more objects and in both parts you might see some parts that require a use of kinematics formulas and that sort of stuff or you might not it kind of depends on the question so i'm going to start with the part one because part one tends to be a little simpler and let's hope i can finish it in 20 minute time limit and then uh, i think we'll have enough time for me to do the, the part two just uh, one more time as well and again i've loaded the dice here so that the question the test student will get won't be one of the questions i've done in the past so I, do I remember what question it was? I don't think I fully remember. So, um, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 this, this train question. Um, it's a, it, this will involve a circular motion. Um, it says, uh, train traveling on a level track makes this turn of radius R. As the train makes the turn, ceiling lamp is seen at this angle theta. Also in the train are passengers sitting in the seat and the pull table as shown in the figure below. Describe the, oh yeah. So you have more than one object, but these are all independent of each other. I think that's how I justified it. <laughs> I think. All right. Um, so let me uh, first draw a free body diagram that will help me describe them in words. So I have a free body diagram of the lamp. So lamp, as I look at it, uh, it should have gravity on it, you know, mass of the lamp times g. And I look at what other things are touching it. And nothing else is touching it other than this string. So there must be a tension force going in that direction. That's at angle theta. It's the same angle as that. You can kind of draw parallel lines to prove that. Oh, yeah, that's the same angle. So that's a free body diagram for the lamp. Let's draw it for the passenger. So for the passenger, um, well, let's see. So there's always going to be gravity. So let me draw gravity. Mass of the passenger times g. And I know passengers not accelerating downward. So there must be an upward force pushing him upward so that passengers not accelerating vertically. Now, as I look at this, something should tell me um, this is not a complete free body diagram. So I know with this uh, circular motion, there is a centripetal acceleration that's pointed this direction. That's why with the lamp, I was okay. Oh, I see horizontal component that gives me the centripetal acceleration. And with a passenger, I need this acceleration, which means I must have some leftward force somehow. Comes from somewhere. And as you look at it, you might notice, oh, the passenger is touching this seat. So there's some force from the seat. And I can leave that there. Once I have that left to direct to the force, then this free body diagram looks complete enough. It, um, it's able to give me the acceleration I need. And finally, let me draw the free body diagram for the table. So um, same as before, there's always going to be gravity. Now, uh, I know table's not accelerating downward, so there must be an upward force. Uh, let me say no more force on table, no more force on passenger. And again, same with the passenger. I know I must have some left toward the force in order that the table is accelerating along with everything else. And here, the table isn't touching anything else uh, vertically. So that force uh, must be coming from the, 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 the bottom contact surface. So I already identified the normal force. There can be friction force. Um, due to the, the floor and the table. So that those are my three complete free body diagrams. Let me um, describe them. Um, on the ceiling lamp, there are two forces, a uh, gravity pulling uh, vertically downward and tension force T uh, pulling um, diagonally upward to the left uh, at angle theta from, from the vertical. On the passenger, there are three forces, uh, gravity pulling down, normal force uh, supporting the passenger up, 
and uh, um, um, and the uh, um, uh, horizontal force from the seat um, to the left. Um, on the table, there are, are three forces: uh, gravity pulling down, um, normal force from floor supporting the table up and friction force from the floor uh, pulling the table to the left. And because it says identify the source of each force described, uh, let me say uh, gravity is um, equated by Earth on all three objects. All right, good. And uh, you know when you write this description, imagine you are drawing, uh, you are uh, writing a written word description of your free body diagram for someone who's blind. That's exactly how I want you to describe it because of the you know the limitation is that this sensor box doesn't allow you to attach um, image, and I want uh, the work that you'll be attaching to be associated with something you submitted within the twenty minute time limit. Okay, so with that, um, in part B, it asks what angle. Um, does the ceiling make uh, ceiling lamp make with the vertical? So let me copy this over and use it as a starting point. Because I, I do uh, want to be and need to be using the, the um, standard strategy. And this is already my standard strategy step one. So I might as well use it and not waste um, precious time with this. Ooh, let me uh, try making use of this uh, scratching out thing. Come on, the one time I want it to work, it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> I hate user interface. Well, okay, B. So I have the free body diagram. Step number two in the standard strategy is defining my axis. So I want to define my axis in such a way that my x-axis, positive x-axis, along the direction of acceleration. So let me define this as my y direction. That's a step number two. Step number three is breaking forces into component. Gravity is fine, beautiful, already in the y direction. I need to break my tension force into uh, x and y component. So let me uh, draw those components. My x component and the y component. And let me track the angles and so that I have um, correct identification of angles I've been given. So this uh, x component, it's opposite to the uh, angle. So it should be associated with a sine from so. Um, sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So the, 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 the component there is um, the hypotenuse, t times sine theta. And this adjacent side should be is from ka, you know, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. The adjacent side, the y component should be t cosine theta. That's a step number three. Once those steps are done, then I'm ready to do step number four. Write down Newton's second law equations by refer referencing this annotated free body diagram um, here. So my x component will be the acceleration, which I labeled a already. A is equal to um, my x component of force, which is just this, t sine theta divided by mass of the lamp. Um, and my y component of the forces, y, where the acceleration will be zero. That's uh, from the, the way we defined our axis. We wanted the y component of acceleration to be zero. So zero is equal to t, the, the net force, which will be t cosine theta minus mlg minus mlg divided by ml. And uh, to kind of make this look simpler, you can imagine multiplying this through by ml so that you just have to worry about this numerator being zero. So this is the end of the standard strategy. And before you do any additional work, you should look at it and see if you have everything you need. So you have one, two equations, and let's count our unknowns. I don't know acceleration, I don't know tension, and I'm looking for angles, so I don't know angle theta. Uh, I have three unknowns. I, I need an additional um, additional um, 
equation. And this is where I hope you realize that you haven't made use of the fact that this is the centripetal acceleration. And as you look at uh, where they talk about, you know, give your answer in terms of V and R, hopefully that will be a reminder to you because you will remember that my that centripetal acceleration is given by the tangential speed squared divided by R. So here, let me, I'm going to do this solution by hand. So let me just uh, um, um, not be lazy and just to do this slight modification. I'm going to say this acceleration here that's equal to uh, the tangential speed divided by r. So this will be the version of equation one I'll use. So I don't have to worry about acceleration anymore. It's not in my equation. This is my equation. So I have two unknowns, tension and uh, angle theta, two equations. I should be able to solve it. Let me solve it. So since I'm looking for angle theta, uh, this is how I'm going to solve it. I'm going to solve one of my two equations for theta and then plug it into the other equation. I think uh, if I set up my second equation as t cosine theta minus mlg is equal to zero, I can solve this for tension. <coughs> That's uh, mlg divided by, I move this over, divided by cosine theta. So that's the tension. I can plug this into the first equation to, um, to get an expression that doesn't depend on tension. So plugging it in, I have mlg over cosine theta. Now times sine theta over ml. Oh, mass cancels out. That's great because I don't think uh, I was allowed to use mass of the length. So mass cancels out. And we can do a little bit of simplification. Oh, wait, I have to finish writing my right-hand side. My right-hand side was uh, V squared over R. So one bit of simplification that's nice is to combine these uh, three expressions into a single trigonometric function that will give you more options for uh, solving for angle theta. So I'm going to write down tangent theta times g is equal to V squared over R. So this is an expression where I can solve it for a tangent of theta. Solving it for tangent of theta, I get that's equal to V squared over RG. Ah, now I can just solve for theta by applying the inverse function, you know, pass the entire thing through the arc tangent. When you do that, you do have to be careful. You do need to have a sense of what kind of a size your theta is. Is it going to be in the first quadrant, in the second quadrant, in the third, in the fourth quadrant? Here, I kind of have a sense my theta will be an acute angle in the first quadrant. So if I do arc tangent, it, that's going to be fine. On the left-hand side, it'll cancel out and give me theta. On the right-hand side, it'll be arc tan of this combination of quantities which I can type in into my answer box. So I'll say theta is equal to arc tan of V squared over R times G. Great, that's all. Um, let's do part B. Uh, it says, oh, minimum coefficient friction needed so that the table does not slide. Ah, okay, so I need to go up and let me copy the other free body diagram for the table and we'll start from there. Uh, uh, let me see. Can I use the selection tool without scrolling? Ah, come on, man. <laughs> All right, let me try copying it this way. Okay, this will work. Um, all right. So this is going to be my part to see. And I'm going to do the same kind of, um, follow the same standard strategy steps. I'm using uh, this uh, diagram, which um, I drew in part A. It also happens to me my standard strategy, step number one, drawing of the free body diagram. Um, and standard strategy, step number two, I need to define my coordinate axis. Um, you, I usually want my x-axis, positive x-axis, to be in the direction of the acceleration. Um, my y-axis is that way. And um, I need to, third step, I need to break down forces. Nothing to break down here, so let me let it be. Fourth step, I need to... Um, I, I need to oh, write down Newton's second law equation. So let me do that. So uh, I'm going to probably need both x and y uh, versions of the expression. So let me do x first. 
I add up all my forces in the x direction, which turns out to be just the friction force. Uh, so my acceleration, which, uh, you know, by now I know it, that's a v squared over r. So let me write that, that which is the acceleration. That's equal to my um, friction force divided by mass of the table. Mm. Okay, y component of forces. The uh, acceleration is going to be zero. And that zero comes from the normal force minus the oops, mt times g um, gravitational force divided by mass of the table. So as you look at it, um, I think I was counting my unknowns and I see I have one, two equations and I have um, these are known. Acceleration, I can ignore it. Friction force is unknown and normal force is unknown. And you might think, oh, great. So we can solve for it, except, um, you know, it's actually asking for minimum coefficient of friction needed. It's asking for this. So I actually have three unknowns, <laughs> including the quantity they want me to answer it. So what it is, is I need a third equation that relates the actual quantity that the question is asking with some of the other unknowns in my current system of equations. And really what you need is the one that says, you know, the maximum um, static friction force is equal to the coefficient times the normal force. And because I said the maximum, I can use the equality sign. Otherwise for static, it would have had to be inequality. So, uh, so you know, I, for the simplicity of uh, my symbol tracking, I'm going to treat this as just FT. We'll just say we are at the maximum scenario, and this mu min will be mu. So that's my third equation involving the third unknown, three equations, three unknowns. We should be able to solve it. And uh, let me do this by hand. I don't think I have enough time to bring up Sage Math. It's actually quicker to do it by hand. So I'm going to plug this into equation number one to get a system of two equations in terms of two unknowns. So I have v squared over r is equal to this mu uh, times normal force divided by mt. And solving equation two for normal force, I have normal force is equal to uh, mass times g. Oh yeah, that's kind of predictable. I can plug this in here. So doing that gets me um, and multiplying through by left and right by m sub t. I get m sub t times v squared over r is equal to mu times m sub t times g. That's the normal force. Ah, and I see some nice cancellation. And my minimum coefficient of friction solving for it, that must be uh, minimum coefficient of friction divided by g should be v squared over rg. There's some similarity with the, what we solved before, but... Uh, um, let me just uh, leave that there without uh, further explanation. I guess one of the thing is, um, uh, if you do dimensional analysis, you will see that, oh, this is like the only way they can get, be combined in such a way that you get unitless quantity. So there aren't many other forms that the fully correct answer can be in. So uh, that would be one thing I would blame to say, oh yeah, that's why this keeps occurring because that's really the only combination of these parameters that can possibly be correct. <laughs> but uh, since I have two minutes, let me attach my work. And then, um, and uh, by the way, for you, I do recommend that you take some time to organize your work. And uh, you know, this uh, attach work uh, window will be available after you submit, so you don't have to do this within the 20 minute time limit. In fact, I do recommend that you take some time to kind of look through it. Maybe um, if you might have made the mistakes during your time limit, take some time to um, um, uh, spot them, fix them. You're welcome to do that. Um, really, what I when I grade, what I look at is um, what have you completed within the time limit that's indicated by your answer. And what, what's your understanding of this uh, problem that you ended at, which uh, might be fully shown by your attached work. And then, oh, and next week in lab, you will have some, I think it's like next week. Oh, did they submit? I think it automatically submitted. Oh, wait, not yet. Um, why did it reset? Um, 
So next week, you will have some time in lab to do a group review of your timed assessment. So you'll look at your own answers again. And um, if there's anything you missed during this time limit, hey, you'll have time to work on it. You can talk with your classmates while you're doing that. You can, um, you can ask me um, because it's really about you learning um, how to get anything that you might have missed during the time limit. It's okay, I think that's everything. Wow, I finished everything in 20 minutes. <laughs> so it's doable if you know what you're doing. <laughs> but I, I do seriously mean um, the work attached takes the time to organize it. Um, uh, don't do it, I mean, you know, don't do it in a hurry. And even though I did keep my work mostly organized, uh, you know, this doesn't have a lot of explanation. So it's not, it's suboptimal that I'm submitting just because of time limit. So, um, good. Save work and continue. And by the way, so if you submitted, if you're doing review work, that won't allow you to edit your work. It's just a viewing panel. So in order to change your work, what you have to do is you have to refresh this screen that will kind of have you access this from start. Then now you can click on add work to, um, so answer keys will be grayed out. You can't change any of these. That's whatever you submitted within the time limit. And this is the answer box where you can actually make a changes. Uh, and uh, if you make changes, the system will timestamp when you made the last change. And again, uh, some delay from when you submitted your answers is fine. I fully expect that people will be taking some time to organize your work and attach it. Uh, 